mission, it was an MVG mission, night vision goggles, which means we're flying at nighttime using nothing but the um, binoculars that we had. Four, one, four, three, you have it in a Chinook unit that was attached to us called the Washington Air National Guard, who had been going in and out of the same LZ during the daytime weeks prior. So when they heard that we were going to be coming out of Bagram doing it under MVGs, they kind of called us up and said, don't do it because it's really high on the ridgeline, very high winds, and a very steep valley. But the ground force commander wanted to be exfilled under MVGs. So with that being said, we put our most experienced pilot in command on board, we put our most experienced PI, and we put four crew members in the back, not just three. You got a bang up, sir? Okay, hold your forward. Hold your down. Hold your down. Too much. Dropping back down about 500 AGL. Stay right, we'll maintain 81. Okay. Copy that, 206. Looks like we're about two clicks from the LZ. One more now, Mr. Mississippi. It's not like the planes in Kansas. We only got 364 days to go. The winds were pretty high. The landing zone was essentially a rock ledge that was probably 20 meters wide. Colossal 3-1, be careful on the approach. I see a lot of trees on that ridge line. What the pilots were trying to do was back in with the ramp down, put the lip of the ramp on the rock uh, ledge, have the LRAS team, I believe it was seven people, uh, come onto the Chinook and then um, fly away. They had to do a tailgate landing. It's something we practice. It's in our ATM. This is what we do. All right, I'm bringing her down. Keep it steady. Keep it steady. So we were teetering there. They kind of started drifting aft. Close to that tree line, Colossal 3 1. We're right on the ridge. at Bagram, it's probably about 11 o'clock at night, our SP knocked on the doors and said that um, Eric Totten's aircraft went down. The aft rotor system hit a tree, causing the forward and the aft rotor system to collide and completely tore apart the entire helicopter. Nobody survived. We lost all 10. There was nothing but burning embers in the bottom of the valley. We were in disbelief that, like, this could not be happening right now. We were all listening. We were listening for our friends to come home. And they never came home. What happened with the Apache? They left our friends. So this is all the stuff I had from Afghanistan and, and my time active duty in the Army. This is the actual patch that we had on our flight suits. It says, ugly but well hung. This is 10th Mountain's uh, patch they gave to us. Got the Apache, the Hawk, and the, and the Chinook right there.
So they came in that night. We're standing in between our bee huts outside. It was already getting dark. And the captain starts telling us about what happened. He starts telling us that, I guess you heard, the Chinook crashed last night. And those guys pretty much killed themselves and everybody on board. And he came across blaming them. Sat there for what seemed like forever. They go, what, what the hell? That's, that's horrible. And they said, no, that's not the worst of it. You know, you, what do you mean that's not the worst of it? So like, yeah, 10th Mountain is blaming us, the Apaches, for leaving them. Your buddies left them. At that point, he said, like, if y'all hear anything from 10th Mountain bad about us, just ignore them. They don't know what they're talking about. And at that point, my blood pressure was through the roof. I pointed at the captain and told him, who the fuck are you? It's a bad mouth. American troops like that, who the hell are you to leave American troops on that mountain? Don't you ever do that. How dare you leave our guys like that? I read that every now and then to remind me also that you got to watch out for everybody else in life. He called upon the sum of all of his knowledge and made a judgment. He believed in it so strongly that he knowingly bet his life on it. That he was mistaken in his judgment is a tragedy, not stupidity. Every supervisor and contemporary who ever spoke to him had an opportunity to influence his judgment. So a little bit of all of us goes in with every troop we lose. Yeah, got to read that every now and then. And then with inbound. I haven't been up here since these guys started shooting at him. Oh, really? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to find some RPGs in that wood pile down there. Stay to the right here so we can get over this thing. If not, we can make a left turn and don't descend unless you have to, all right? Crash it. Keep the altitude that we've got. Or if we can come over the top of the shy con here. What we were being told to expect coming into Afghanistan was that the insurgency was ba basically broken. Deadwood 66, Dog 37, over. Dog 37, Deadwood 66, go ahead. Roger. Uh, Reaffirm the in info. This trap the enemy in a cave. Uh, approximately three personnel, over. All right, rolling in. Deadwood 66, Roger. Uh, we're rolling in. Hot at this time. And we turn on the lights, we found a lot of Taliban and Al Qaeda, and all of a sudden we were in contact just about everywhere. Yeah, smoke right now. Yeah. Right. There they are right there. making friends when we first started so god help us we've got 10 months left and it will be brutal we had to be perfect on this day it was a day mission we were just to follow several chinooks as they made it to the different fobs dropping off different things and people Coming in from the west, we'd 
flying across the Gardez Desert. I was looking around, and just at that point, I was thinking, geez, what is wrong? It was like a solid rush of heat. <laughs> Something's going wrong here. Something, I want to get out of the helicopter. The Apache helicopter went down while trying to land at the Montgomery County Airport. Geez, we're roasting across the, the desert floor at 120 knots. If I just get out of here, all I got to do, all I got to do is just maybe just open the door and just jump out, jump out. Daniel Flores, chopper went down. I've got a hot spot under my helmet. I got to change my helmet here. I got to move my helmet around. Jesus, I got to get out of here. How did I even drive home? My wife will wake me up any minute now. And I'm like, geez. Just take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath. I gotta get out of here. This is, just take a deep breath. That was my first bout of what would later become claustrophobia, anxiety, and anxiety attacks that go with it. That was the first time I'd ever experienced something like that. Somewhere in the crumpled metal of the Apache helicopter lies a clue as to what made it fall from the sky. We set up to do traffic patterns. I was doing the flying from the front seat. Just as I was about to reduce power to land to the approach end of runway 14, a Learjet calls up on the radio saying, Montgomery County traffic, this is Learjet 65 Charlie. We are four mile final for runway 14. I was thinking, yeah, this guy is going to be bearing down on us pretty fast. So as I'm starting to slow down even more to land, Tommy's thinking the same thing. He took the flight controls, and we went forward a little bit. That's the last thing I remember. Less than five minutes after takeoff, the chopper fell to the ground, its landing gear mired in the mud. Chief Warrant Officers Daniel Flores and Thomas Einhorn were shaken up in the crash. Both were taken to Medical Center Hospital in Conroe, put under observation, then released. How did I survive? Literally by the grace of God. That was in August when I had that first bout of anxiety. I went and saw the flight surgeon. He, I told him what was going on. He worked with me a little bit. Not much. He just said, you, uh, you got to learn to live with it, or you want me to take you off flight status? And there was no way I could do that. So I did what we all do in the military. I fought through it. On that day, early October 2006, We'd already set the aircraft up, as we call them. We cocked them up uh, for the QRF, Quick Reaction Air Force. We just sit around and wait for the radios to come alive to go help somebody. We were in the chow hall, and our ICOM radios came to life. The Apache crew, Deadwood, launched the QRF right now. We all looked at the radio going like, are they serious? <laughs> this has never happened before. We ran across the flight line. The other Apache on the QRF, they were already sitting at 100% RPMs waiting for me. All right, clear right and left, clear. We were stationed at Bagram at the time. Most of our QRF missions were just escorting medevacs. So it was a little odd that we were actually dispatched to a firefight in the Togob Valley because as far as we know, at the time, the Togob was quiet. October 14th was our first mission to roll 
down through the valley of Tagab and meet with the senior members of the village and conduct a shura. And we were also taking along a donation of um, school supplies that we were going to pass along to the children of the village. I had turned 50 in 2006. And I arrived in Afghanistan. I was not assigned to a unit. I was a forces command fill because they needed embedded tactical trainers, ETTs. The job as an ETT, as an embedded tactical trainer, is you're supposed to embed with the Afghan army and you, you liaise between the US military and the Afghan military. We were two-man teams, one officer and one senior enlisted. Hall and Best, you go over there, and you guys report to your unit. We reported, and they said, OK, you guys are just going to be paired up. It's total happenstance. You would have these teams embedded in 100 to 200 Afghan National Army personnel, you know, because only once you got them sufficient to where they could secure and govern themselves, could we leave? When we left Najrab, my vehicle was uh, commanded by Lieutenant Hall. He was sitting in the team chief seat, and then I was the gunner in the uh, turret. And we had Nasser as our interpreter in the back with radios to allow us to communicate with the Afghan forces that we were working with. I was a civilian contractor. When I was working with the coalition forces in NATO, my position was an interpreter, and I was doing language services. Nasser was, was one of those kids who loves his country so much, he loves Afghanistan so much, that he did whatever he could to help out. It wasn't about the paycheck with him. It was all about helping his country. In Afghanistan, in the villages, uh, as soon as the light's up and after prayer, they open up shop and they close when they want to close. Uh, so when we were going down through, no shops were open. As we moved through the little village of Afghania, we noticed that the kids weren't out there waving, giving us thumbs up. We started seeing women and children running from the fields. We continued on up the road, and there was an Afghan National Police post that you could always see Afghan National Police walking on top of. The building was completely abandoned. So that kind of put your spidey senses on, on tingle a little bit. As we rolled past that post, the Afghan commander stopped the vehicle and was calling Nasser our interpreter on the radio and telling us to stop. Uh, so I asked him what's going on. He said, uh, enemy, enemy. Stop right here! The Afghan commander comes out. He walked out, he snatched a Dragunov sniper rifle. He stuck it into a hole in a compound. gets back out and smiles and looks at me and goes, two, I got two. That's when I learned what it sounds like to get shot at. I began returning fire and Lieutenant Hall called back to the rear American vehicle to alert them that we were, we had troops in contact. Big long convoy, right? Nine, ten vehicles, something like that. The front three or four are the ones that are getting engaged right now. I'm a lieutenant. I have a captain uh, in the, the Humvee to my rear. Their radio's not working or something, and so he gets out and starts running up 
to us, bounding and hopping. And uh, he comes up to say, hey, what's, what's going on? Uh, and that's when I kind of give him the situation. Hey, get some guns up high. When I turned my face, I saw uh, rounds were heading in the Humvees. Four! Shots at four o'clock! The whole time, I'm, I'm trying to call for air support. I know if I can get some Apaches, they come with rockets, big guns, and they can they come with elevated positions. You don't want to send one aircraft out on its own ever. That was policy at the time. In case one goes down, you want to have somebody else there to be able to provide support for them. Let's stay up high where I can get them inside. Don't get stuck down in there. All right. When they dispatch us to these situations, all we get is a brief troops in contact at this grid location. Here's a radio frequency. Go make contact with them and help them. The front seaters put in the coordinates to the entrance, the northern entrance of the Tagal Valley, where what we call we're buster. We're going as fast as we can, military power. We didn't have any intelligence, you know, on you know who these guys were, or what they were, what their mission actually was at the time. We knew we were supposed to go talk to Vandal 16, which was Lieutenant Hall, and escort him back, uh, back to their base. Any vandal element, any vandal element, this is Deadwood 63. All these people must trail to the right. From the time we launched to the time we got to the north end of the Tagab was all of 15 minutes at the most. Those guys had already been in a protracted fight for easily two hours before we got called out. They were getting surrounded by the Taliban. Deadwood 67 is now 16. We are in convoy. Uh, to evac out of here. Okay, he's coming in high. Good hey guys, Roger, are you still in contact at this time? From the standpoint of a helicopter pilot, one of these things is just like all of the others. It's a lot more of a significant experience for the guys who are actually on the ground, swapping bullets with the bad guys back and forth. came out and tried to envelop us on both sides, kind of like a bull's horns, and try to enclose us in and circle us on both sides. Now the Afghans, they fight hard and they fight with no body armor, they fight with no pay, no socks, some of them don't have bootlaces, I mean, they, they fight hard. It was kind of inspiring to, to, to work with these Afghan guys who, who did so much with so little. Need more rounds, need more rounds. Terry is in the gun shooting. He's focused on uh, firing rounds and suppressing the enemy. I thought to myself, because the Mark 19 hurt a lot of them, maybe that will be the next target. And I yelled on them to move, move, move from that place. Hey, move, move forward. After they moved, fortunately, uh, they had that place with the RPG, but the uh, Humvee was not there. 
and that was our ride back also to go to the base. So uh, to make sure we don't have to walk. <laughs> Over about a 45 minute period, we were able to quell the contact. We thought the fight is finished. One of the company commander, he sent one of his platoon soldiers with a squad to go down, see uh, the damages. When those people came back, they brought a flag of the Taliban, which was on the top of one of the compound. So we were just taking some photos. The Taliban already had the Afghan army radio scanned. They was listening the Afghan army communications in their radio. The one of the Taliban guy, maybe their leader or one of their men, he called the call sign of that platoon sergeant when he answered uh, and responded yes. And he start, uh, uh, sorry to say that, he said, we're going to fuck you guys up. At this point, we still had integrity of our convoy with a American vehicle in the lead, um, followed by five Afghan vehicles and then an American vehicle. The senior person on this convoy was in the rear vehicle. And he asked Lieutenant Hall to have our vehicle maintain our position while they moved up. Some of his people got out, captain got out, went to aggress and, and moved to another building. Hey, watch the rifle leave! Hey, yeah, you got right. straddle. Leave it, leave it, don't touch. Oh my god, dude. Where's Cass? We had been calling for the Apaches for three hours. Now we were running out of ammo, running out of, out of fuel, and, but I was so focused on what was going on, um, I didn't really worry about what could happen if they didn't come. get over the northern end of the Tagab Valley, and uh, we're circling, circling what seemed like, oh, man, at least 30 minutes. I see smoke at uh, 1 o'clock, about two miles. Okay, we're uh, armed. Yeah, we're armed all the way around. Yeah, with 6-7, do you have eyes on the Humvee? Over. There's a couple of Humvees rolling in. Sure enough, we find a convoy that was engaged on an orchard on the other side of a ravine. Vandal, what the heck, sir? It's Vandal Hill, then just give us a direction where you're taking fire from. We can put down suppressed fire. Roger, Dan, we'll pick down a late one. Seven, do you have eyes on our location? Over. He's trying to direct us where we need to put fire down on. It's a little more difficult for us during the day to identify specifically where they're being attacked from because, you know, at nighttime you can see the rounds coming off. You can see where the fires are coming from. Uh, you can utilize the FLIR, uh, but it's more difficult during the day because you're primarily using your naked eye. Six, seven, that's a 
when Vandal gets on the radio saying like, who are you guys shooting at? We are a convoy at the south end of the Tagab. We're all standing behind this wall and, and shooting to our east. Is that what you're seeing? He says, yeah, see, see, everybody's shooting to the east. I'm like, well, that's us, but I don't see you. to uh, Lieutenant Hall on the radio. The radio reception was crystal clear, but we were not supporting him. He was, what, five or seven kilometers maybe further south of where we were. Oh my God, who did we just shoot? Shoot. Uh and got on the radio and he called for a medevac. The medevac indicated that they would push one up, but that they would not land until the area was secure. So the captain indicated to Lieutenant Hall that he was taking half the Afghans and the ambulance, and they were gonna roll back to combat outpost Najrab. And uh, you continue the fight. <laughs> Lieutenant Hall, indicated he did not think it was a good idea. I was uh, very vocal from my position that it was an absolutely horrible idea. They needed to understand they still had 10 people pinned down. I took away a big gun. Uh, on top of that Humvee is a 50 cal. We have a Mark 19, an automatic grenade launcher. You split those up and you don't have anybody to cover for him while he's reloading. I'm out, I'm out, I need more rounds. You don't choose who leads you in those situations. They get force-fed to you. And my job as an enlisted soldier is to mitigate the mistakes they make. The shots are coming from right below us! left us with only one American vehicle, and the American vehicles were out there because we had the most firepower and because we could communicate with the skies. So this was a month after my first real deal claustrophobic anxiety attack. It was on the back of my mind. If I 
had a moment to stop and reflect. Yeah, here it comes. And that's when I started realizing that as long as I can keep my mind preoccupied with something else, yeah, the chances of having an anxiety attack was much, much less. What we actually wound up flying over first was a ground QRF force that had been sent out from their base to go help them. And so we supported those guys at first for a good 10, 15 minutes or so before we realized this is not where we're supposed to be. As soon as they got over the orchard where the fighting was going on, sure enough, there was a volley of RPGs and smoke from all the shooting. I quickly slammed the stick to the left, lined up my rockets, and fired off three high explosive rockets. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, that felt great. Uh, in the trenches, so we had to get everybody, find them all with no radios, get them all back in the, in the vehicles. And I'm calling, and I'm trying to talk to the Afghans, and I don't know, I don't know Dari, so I'm trying to find my interpreter, and he's up on the front line, you know, taking ammo to the Afghans. I had to call him and, and provide cover fire for him to start bounding back to me, and I had to grab him by the collar and, and try to yell at him, you know, hey, I need you with me, man. <laughs> I need you to stay with me. We finally got everybody together. You know, we started started to move out. There was about 500 enemy insurgents in the valley at that time. When we came down, all the the enemy insurgents decided to come out to the road because they knew we'd have to come back. And they laid in probably seven, eight ambushes for us along those 17 kilometers. I 
could see that they were starting to head north along the road. I rolled in, flying as fast as I could, catching up to the convoy and roasted over them at about 100 feet to let them know that we were with them and for any other possible ambushes in front of them to know that there's Apaches that are protecting our guys on the ground. village they came up to looked literally like an old western town with a dirt road down the middle. It was a tight one lane road with buildings on either side. That's when Vandal 1-6 screams out on the radio that they're shooting from the rooftops. They were literally putting the gun over the edge and just squeezing the trigger and, and letting, letting them fly. We can take out that house. That's where they were shooting from. I'm checking to see where they, these shots came from. I was in a position right there just above the town Saw one building, and I thought, all right, I'm fixing to put a rocket right through the top of it. I have an alternator for you, sir. Okay, we're uh, armed. Yeah, we're armed all the way around. But it didn't feel right. He's got nowhere to go if he gets shot. Yeah. Well, five, five. All right, just get ready. Roger. I eased off and circled around and thought, all right, give them a little bit of time before I go making a shot and possibly killing innocents in there because it's still, it's still a country where normal people that don't want to be in this war, that's where they live. So in my mind, that was a good, a good decision not to take that shot. He's pointing that way somewhere. What the hell? Those guys are aimed off straight in front of us. There's anybody down here left low. I'm looking and I'm lost. So that's when I started making runs up and down the road, popping flares to let people know that if you mess with them, we will level this town. I see some flares on the Okay, Roger. Afghans stopped because of taking fire, and they got out of the vehicles to try and engage. They were out fighting because they didn't want to be in their vehicles, so we get them back in the vehicles and we start moving again. to be in black on ammo, meaning that we were out of ammo. I had used all my Mark 19 rounds, so the guys in the skies had the only rounds that were uh, really being fired. Considering how many people were stacked up against them, they were sitting ducks. The fob was not even a mile away. And that's when Vanda 16 yells out, they're shooting from the fields. They're shooting from the field.
My front seater saw somebody run into the field shooting. There we go. gotten so good at this point with shooting rockets that I could put a rocket in a window at a mile away, no problem. By about that time, the convoy made up the last hill to the FOB. If we would not have shown up at the time that we did, the chances are they would have had a lot more casualties, if not all of them, getting killed. They secured our safe passage out of that valley. I mean, we shot a lot of ordnance that day in, in, those, in those three and a half hours. Terry brought 700 rounds of, of grenades, 700 grenades that he shot. The Afghan are an amazing fighting force, and uh, Matt is the best battle buddy I've ever had. If we would have had to run back through that gauntlet without cover fire, who knows how many people would have made it back. We saved them that day. We saved them that day. We got back that night and, uh, you know, we had flat tires and we had no ammo. We were tired. And there was a point where, uh, you know, I sat and, on a berm and just kind of looked out into the distance. You know, I needed a minute. And uh, Nasser came up and, and sat down and I said, hey, you know, I, you know we, we fired a lot of grenades and we fired a lot of guns and you know, we, we shot a lot of things. And um, I'm sure we killed some bad guys, but I'm, I'm worried that we um, that we killed, you know, maybe, maybe women and children, I don't know. And he kind of put his hand on my shoulder and said, we did good today. You know, we did, we did good. You did good today. That was huge. That little 10 seconds probably saved a lot of, a lot of therapy and issues for me later in life. There's a whole lot of lightning going on. Actually, it's fixing to rain like crazy on us here in just a second. So we either need to get in the Hawk or get back in this thing. And here it comes. Well, like I said, we didn't, we didn't make it. This is just like Jurassic Park. So as long as we don't move, we should be OK. But it's raining like crazy. And we're Sarconi in bad guy country. Dust off the other Apache and us. I'm expecting the T-Rex any minute now, so we're not moving. And I'm scared. Signing out for now. <laughs> Christmas 2006. And what are we doing, all of us from Texas? Shoveling snow. Shoveling snow. snow. You would think we lived in Amarillo. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Anyway, it's sometime in the middle of the afternoon. It's snowing like crazy. And it's been snowing all night. All our Christmas. We had two weeks left before we were to start packing up and heading home after a year-long battle there in Afghanistan. 
fighting it increased tremendously. At the morning brief, we got the weather for the day, and we got all the missions that were going out. One of the missions that I'd heard was taking the code to the Corngall Valley in a Blackhawk to go visit the FOPs. The code is the general. I was going to spend Christmas Eve of 2006 with uh, Captain McKnight and his company up in the Korangal outpost. We had been collecting all these letters to see the smiles on troops' faces when they open a to any soldier letter. It just makes a huge difference. Completely socked in, snow, fog, everything. I tell my aide, all right, look, we're going to go New Year's Eve. It snowed out, fogged out. Well, January 5th, 2007 was a crystal clear day. All right. OK, uh, tail wheel's locked, park brake, I'll be on you. Yeah, park brake's release. released, handle is in, tail wheel's okay. locked, lights out. System check. And systems, I got no crossings, no transfers, we're full of gas. All the way across, engine instruments are green, 3,000 hydraulics, no caution, no warnings. Four systems are checked. We're good. Okay, active fly to not required. First, the weapons binder secure. Uh, 144 is uh, right side. The Korngal Valley was the most hotly contested valley in all of Afghanistan. The Valley of Death is what some people called it. Action right here. We're on the back side of the Shai Khan. And we started heading to the east towards Jalalabad and then north to Asadabad. Two types of people that troops often talk about regarding who you'll find in a firefight are those that will immediately return fire or initiate fire because their training kicks in and they execute. And then you have some that are more contemplative and take a step back and, and hesitate. But I didn't see too many of those. What I saw mostly were troops that whenever uh, we needed a, a fire on, on target, uh, rounds on target, they would put it on target. And there's no greater demonstration of that than that January 5th, 2007 day. We got radio traffic saying that there's a troops in contact, a fight going on in the Pesh River Valley right before the Korngal Valley. So we had to land at Asadabad to let that fight play out because we could not go past there. At that point, the code gets out of the Blackhawk, runs into the talk, and a second later, they call us up on the radio saying, like, Deadwood, can you go over there to that tick and help stop it so we can go on to the Korngal Valley. I promptly said, like, we're the only Apache out here. We're not allowed to go single ship anywhere in this country. And right about then is when the talk called up and said, the code has just authorized you to go single ship. OK, Captain, be looking for So we took off, talked to Dog 37 on the ground, and he said up on this ridge line, the entrance of the Shiriak Valley, there's uh, somebody shooting at him with RPGs and some you know, small arms fire. Hey, Dog, this is Edward 66. Where are you at from me right now? Is that you right? Uh, are you on the main road? Uh, dog 37, negative. We are at the control base. We are east of you right now as you're flying over. Right there somewhere. And run. 
when the, the gun stopped shooting. We could hear it cycling, but no bullets were coming out. Got the other rounds already. No way. It sounded like the gun was running, but it wasn't fired. Okay, dog 37, dead with 66. Either way, our bullets or our gun is broke. Uh, we're gonna head back to a and uh, continue with the mission. We'll be backing up in a little bit. Dog 37, copy over. At that point, we went back to the Satabad. The uh, crew chiefs on the ground there at the Satabad said, like, hey, do you need any fuel? And I said, no, but could you check the gun, see if it's broke or not? So they open up the uh, avionics bay, and they check the gun. And sure enough, we're just out of bullets. So the kid comes back with a big ammo can of 30 millimeter. And then they look at us, and that's when we find out that they don't have the proper equipment to load the 30 millimeter bullets into the Apache. Unbeknownst to us, that was taken away a week ago. Bullets going into the Corngall Valley was an absolute necessity. We had to have bullets. So I suggested, hey, how about if we fly back down to Jalalabad here and uh, get our guys to put bullets in our Apache, refill us with gas, and we'll be back up here 45 minutes tops, and then we can go on into the Corngall. At that point, I saw the, the code getting out of the talk and running and getting into his Black Hawk. And right at that point, Archangel gets on the radio and says like, hey, you guys, the code's ready to go. You've got rockets and missiles. Let's go. Roger, uh, I just got word that uh, General says that uh, you need to have an escort with you. Over. Uh, Star 37, good copy, over. I took off, Archangel, the Black Hawk with the code, takes off right behind me, rolling straight into the Corngall Valley. the lumberyard or Cornwall outpost or the cop tell them that uh, is Deadwood inbound with the code. clip because we know that there's enemy in the area holes start appearing in the side of the helicopter which you know either rivets are popping or somebody's shooting at us and of course it was the latter and the left engine catches on fire as we're landing uh, hard landing inside the Corngall outpost so they're on the ground dropping off the code and the package and whatever else they had and I'm circling overhead, and Les and myself, my co-pilot, we're discussing, like, okay, we'll go back to Jalalabad, get some bullets in this helicopter, and that should be about the time we come back to pick up the, the code. All he's got to do is drop off when we go back to Abad. Yeah, as far as we know, that's all he's doing. You know, we ought to, well, I don't know how much time they got, but I think we could run down to Abad. I mean, I mean, jab, jab, and get, get bullets. 
At that point, they came under attack. Now we're in a full-fledged ambush. There's rocket, propel grenades, crisscrossing like roaming candles. And there's machine gun rounds coming in. Captain McKnight comes running up and, and grabs me by the body armor and says, sir, the last thing I need is a dead general in my base camp. Go, 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 go. Coming down the hill is a young man named Sergeant Vile. And Sergeant Vile gets shot. gets up, ties off his own tourniquet, and we all go piling into the command post, be that what it was. The Corngall outpost was under pretty significant contact at this time. There you go. And I'm watching Sergeant Vile, who is starting to go into shock, but he was the mortar ballistic computer operator. He had a very important job. He has a radio, and he's punching numbers into his mortar ballistic computer. And his left arm was severely wounded. There's blood dripping on the plywood floor. I tap the medic and say, you need to check him out. He's getting ready to go into shock because he was visibly shaking. And um, the medic sort of smirked at me and says, you don't know Sergeant Vile, sir. And I said, that may be, but, you know, he looks like he's going to. And so the medic goes over, I guess, not wanting to upset the general. And Sergeant Vile turns at him and growls, you know, get the F away from me. And this is the, you know, the beauty of the American soldier is that he didn't want to let his teammates down. At this point, there's a string of bullets coming at me between myself and Archangel. Oh, shit. What was that? Right. There they are right there. I rolled in hard left, and I thought, geez, I have no bullets. At that point, I could not go to a rocket shot because the Corngall outpost was right on the other side. Yeah, that smoke right there? Yeah. Shit. Uh, yeah, you were taking fire just then. Uh, I don't think you saw it. It was left low. I squeezed over and I said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Shove the helicopter over into a negative G push, squeeze that trigger. It was right there. there yeah, right there, right there. Oh! It was 668, y'all. Oh, Come on. Nothing was coming out. I was in a one and a half negative G push. The safety inhibit on the Apache keeps me from firing rockets at that point. You could see flashes of everybody shooting at us from that ridge line. It was like the paparazzi was right in front of us. I pulled back on the stick at that time to get out of the stream of gunfire coming at me. That's when I saw my, my wife and my kids at the front of the door of our house thinking, that how could dad have gotten killed with less than two weeks left? And then I looked and I saw my daughter smiling, saying, no, um, it's not going to happen. Uh. My co-pilot says, Daniel, you're hyperventilating. That was the point where I thought, like, no, stop. Finally, I breathe again. So now I'm trying to line up the nose and trying to get at least a half a positive G to get a rocket out. And sure enough, by the grace of God, I fire one rocket and it goes right center mass. 
around screaming on the radio telling the corn gall outpost we're taking fire from this spot get a fire mission going you hear the loud thunk of the mortar go off <laughs> the hang time's probably about a minute it's just silent in there except for some of the machine gun rounds coming in but nobody was talking and you hear the explosion The machine gun round stop. Vial gets confirmation of a first round direct hit. He pushes the mortar ballistic computer across the picnic table to his private. He turns to the medic and he says, now you can work on me. At that point, I can see the Taliban running on the ridge line. Yeah, we're six, six. We're engaged him right now. We've got a pop. We got him right in front of us. And that's when I just began to fire as fast as I could all the rockets I could. And actually remembering a World War II pilot that I know saying, wiggle the pedals back and forth a little bit. That way, all your rockets won't end up in one spot. I wiggle the pedals just a little bit right and left as I'm squeezing the rockets and making my rockets hit everywhere around them. Fuck that there we go. Swing back around again, run out of high explosive rockets, start shooting flechettes. 2,000 two inch nails coming at those guys, ripping into them. You got this one. You put that's it. Yeah, another one flechette. I'm going to go really pee on this one. Okay. After that, run out of flechettes, come back around, and I start shooting white phosphorus. At that point, I have nothing left. I call the, the uh, Cornwall outpost, tell them, like, we are Winchester. We are out of here. All right, 766, Winchester, we're out of here. Roger that, over. Fuck, why wouldn't the rockets shoot on that first run? Damn it, that pisses me off. And no gun. Damn it, of all the... Uh, yeah, all the time, not having a fucking gun, man. The heroism of, of both the Black Hawk crew and the uh, Apache crew uh, was just unbelievable. They stayed on station when it was so risky, so dangerous to help the troops on the ground. Are you sure your guys did not take a hit? Because they were shooting all over you. Yeah, we're pretty sure we took a hit. Our generators out, our stabilizers out. Um, well, I mean, it's totally pliable, but we're going to have to shut down and take a look at it when we get through uh, AVAT. And we're going to have to try to launch the other aircraft for uh, as close as you guys. Sounds good. Much later that evening, they send uh, another Black Hawk out to uh, recover my team and me. I, you know, I had five other stops I was going to make that day, but that that sort of changed the whole dynamic of, of the visit. And, and so all the 2 any soldier uh, packages and letters, they all stayed right there. We put Sergeant Vile on our aircraft and medevaced him to Bagram. And uh, before he got evac'd, I pinned on his Purple Heart. He's a personal hero of mine today. This was the best teamwork I've ever seen. It was completely unrehearsed. It was all instinctual. These pilots knew what to do. The soldiers knew what to do. It was one of those days where I was never prouder to be an American fighting soldier because everybody did their job above and beyond the call of duty and avoided what really could have been 
a catastrophic type of event. It was just an incredible sight to see. There was a, a moment a few years ago where he had uh, tweaked his elbow pretty bad and he was in a cast. And uh, we were just all sitting in here watching TV one night and he just started sweating profusely and got up and just pacing around the room and cussing, saying, I need to get out of this. I need to get out of this cast right now. They need to take this off because he was having an anxiety attack for being claustrophobic. Then I started to think about it more and looking back at like, when we went Colorado and packed into that gondola, packed into long car rides, where you would start to notice he's a little off about something, but he's trying to hide it, but he can't just quite do it. It did humanize him a little bit to see him act this way, you know, have this episode. But uh, for the most part, I mean, it was maybe two minutes of that, and then he calmed right back down and just sat back down and said, no, I Need to call the doctors tomorrow, tell them to help me out with this. And then we just went right back to uh, watching whatever we were watching. For a while there, it was pretty intense. And with the cast thing, like Eric was talking about earlier on his arm, that surprised me also. I really never even thought about something like that. I was thinking more of, you know, the gondola, being in an enclosed space kind of made sense to me. But having something on your arm didn't really make any sense why that would bother him. He wrote this book, and the, you know, maybe thousands of people are gonna read and he's talking about it just like it's a normal thing, but he didn't quite talk about it to everyone at home. And uh, it was a little off-putting, you know, reading it, but I mean, you, you understand it's a, it's a part of it and it's a part of the story that he needs to tell. Good to meet you, Ross. Hey, Ross. Hey, great to see you, brother. Great to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> it's great to see you. And who are these guys? Nasser, my buddy. How are you? Good to see you. Nasser, I'm Daniel. Nice to meet you, brother. And Terry. Terry, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you, Nasser. Good to see you. Nice to meet you, brother. Good to see you, Nasser. 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 Good to see you, that is too good. And he was the door gun or uh, I was the uh, gunner so he, up top the mark name. He was the gunner, he was in the back seat, and, and I was the TC. All so right. Vandal 1-6. Yep. One seven. One seven. The and guy's Nasser. relaxing in the black seat. <laughs> <laughs> he was handing the rounds up to me. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well guys, y'all wanna just uh, step inside the bar or we can just hang out, yeah, grab a grab yeah. a cold yeah. drink if well, you like. He's uh, a toast to Afghanistan to our army, family, and friends, and all those that didn't get to come back. Here's Megan Holmes. Our inbreed from that captain um, from uh, 26 Cab, it said, like, guys, everything's heating up there, the corn gall and the pest, but he goes, but don't forget the Tagal, because it and is about to explode. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, whatever. Same thing, we flew over to all year long. Two months after that, I've forgotten what he said, and then all, one, all of a sudden, one day, we're on QRF. Yeah. And they say, we got a ticket to the top guy. And I'm like, really? There's something going on? There's a firefight in the tech house? Cool. Yes. We have to call say there's a convoy's been ambushed, and there's 200 Taliban out there that uh, are surrounding them. I, I can't remember how long it was, but it had to have been five to 10 minutes. Yeah. And we were supporting that QRF team. And that it? It seemed like five hours. I <laughs> did. I thought the same thing, too. <laughs> I, I was looking over the sky, I'm like, you guys are saying, hey, I'm dropping rounds. I'm like, I don't see you. I don't let, let, let all your rounds. That's hitting me in the leg. Hey, <laughs> you see him? But like you were saying, 
there were ambushes all the way up there. Yeah, you didn't yeah. shoot anybody that they didn't was up, shoot. up to good. They yeah. were, they were uh, actually after our cure. We were in the business so, of yeah. killing, and right then business all, all was All I could tell was that there was American-made vehicles with A&A &A manning them, and they yeah. were under attack. We started moving up, and as we started moving up, uh, it, you know, it was literally seven different ambushes waiting for us. They were laying on top, not accurate firing, but to hide themselves and firing. When we got back, I had an AK round in between my best wow. and my top. Wow. That, I mean, so, you know, we Holy were like, like, oh my gosh. And yeah, they were, it was, it was crazy. God bless the a &A. They, they would always leave us in the heart in the armored Humvee sick. <laughs> <laughs> we had, I had to get Nasser out saying, but I told him move up, move up, move up. One of the Taliban, he already he was like uh, on the radio channel with the enemy because he was scanning their communication. He called one of the surgeons, which he called me. He took his call sign when he answered yes. <laughs> so, oh yeah. So he said back and forth, he said I'm gonna pack you all now. <laughs> So all you guys are alive. That's what the Taliban said. Wow. Yeah. It's just a kudos. <laughs> <laughs> Smacked by the waves with no bones One more